All right, let's talk about refraction. Now refraction is the changing of speed of a wave in a new medium. What does medium mean? Our well, medium just means the thing that the wave is traveling in. So for sound, the medium could be air, it could be water, it could be a solid as well, uh, which begs the question, what's the medium for light? Well, people used to think that there was a physical medium called the ether, but uh, that was quickly dismissed. If you wanna know all about that, then have a look at the Michelson-Morley experiment. You could say that the medium for light is space itself. Now we give the symbol C for the speed of a wave. Light in a vacuum is very similar for air as well. Is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Light in water, however, travels at about three quarters the speed of light in a vacuum. That's about 2.3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So quite a big difference. When light goes from air to water, the speed changes. Now I'm going to call the speed V here because I'm going to reserve C for the speed of light in a vacuum. But the frequency stays the same. That's kind of weird, isn't it? What's our wave equation? V equals F lambda. If the speed goes down as it goes into water, but the frequency stays the same, then that must mean that the wavelength has to go down as well, because as we know, that the velocity therefore has to be proportional to the wavelength. Whatever one does, the other one does as well. So what does it look like? Here's our air, here's our water, here's our boundary in between. Light comes in, and as it hits the water, the waves start to bunch up. As it goes that way, smaller wavelength, slower velocity. If the light comes head on, that is 90 degrees to the boundary, then the wave will just carry on going in a straight line. It's just that the wavelength will got smaller and it will go slower as well. But what happens if the light comes in at an angle? That's when the really interesting stuff happens. Let's say I had a block of perspex or glass or something like that. Now the light is gonna come from this direction here. We know that light acts like a wave as well as just a particle going from A to B. So let's draw some wave fronts. We're looking down on the wave and these lines represent the peaks of the waves. And they're coming in towards this block. In other words, they're incident on this block. But once the wave reaches the block there, a bit of the wave front actually changes angle. So the waves come in like this, but then as they start entering the block, they turn and we can see that the wavelength has shortened. And once the wave is all the way in, it carries on like that. If I was to draw arrows showing the direction of the wave and where it goes, there's my direction of the wave going in, and then here's my direction of the wave coming out. We can see that it's actually changed direction ever so slightly, but it has. This happens because a bit of the wave front starts slowing down before the rest of the wave front, and so effectively drags the wave front round like that as it goes in. You can think about it like this, if we have a car going along a road. So here's the car going along the road. We're looking down on the car. There's his four wheels. And the driver starts to drop off, starts to veer ever so slightly towards the soft verge where this grass. What happens? We end up with the car's left wheels on the grass, the right wheel still on the road. The left wheels, they will skid, there's less friction, so that means the left-hand side of the car will begin slower than the right-hand side, and it ends up turning. Once it's all the way in, it will just carry on going in that direction because all four wheels are going at the same speed. So we can think about refraction in these terms. Part of the car is slowing down before the other part of the car, so it turns. Same thing with our wave fronts. Luckily though, we do not have to draw wave fronts or cars every time we talk about refraction. So here's my air, 
glass boundary and here is my ray of light coming in. We don't have to draw the wave fronts because this is just a very narrow ray of light. What angle is this ray of light hitting the glass at? We could give this angle here, but that's not as useful as what we actually do. What we do is draw a line that is 90 degrees to the boundary. And that's what we call the normal. Anything that's normal is 90 degrees to something. So we saw that if the light ray slows down as it goes into a new medium, then we can see that if we had a normal on here, we can see that it's bending towards the normal, like so. The normal is what we measure all our angles from. So we measure that angle and then we measure that angle. We never measure the angle between the boundary and the ray of light itself. We're gonna call this angle here theta one and theta two. We could also call them I and R. Whatever you want to call them, I and theta one represent the angle of incidence. What angle the light ray is hitting the material at, the new medium at, and R or theta two is the angle of refraction. So we said earlier that refraction is a change in speed of a wave in a new medium. Generally, when we talk about refraction, we talk about that happening, which results in a change of direction of the wave. So this light ray here has been refracted. If it was going along the normal, then it would slow down, but it wouldn't be refracted because it hasn't changed direction. As per usual, we need some way to quantify the change in direction that's happening here. This is done with something called refractive index and we give it the letter N. All the refractive index is, it's a ratio that tells you how much slower light travels in a medium compared to the vacuum or air. So I can tell you that for glass, the refractive index is 1.5. All this means is that light travels 1.5 times slower in glass than it does in air. So we could say that the speed in the glass is equals to three times 10 to the eight divided by 1.5 and that gives us a speed of two times 10 to the eight meters per second. That's all that refractive index tells you. It has no units because it's just a ratio. So a quick and easy way to remember what a high refractive index tells you. High refractive index or higher refractive index means that light travels slower and we can also call it more optically dense. More optically dense so it's harder for light to travel through it as it were. If light goes from a low refractive index to a high refractive index then the light bends towards the normal. Crude way of remembering it is light wants to get away from the normal. The faster light can travel, the easier it is for it to get away from the normal. So you might see the equation written like this, N equals C over C S. N is refractive index, this is speed in a vacuum, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And this is speed in the medium. But obviously this only works for vacuum or air into another medium. How do we get refractive index though from angles then? Could we say that this is the case? Because we know that the smaller the refracted angle, the bigger the refractive index is going to be. So that means it's more optically dense, but it doesn't work. That doesn't give us the right answer. What does? The sine of the angle, sine i over sine r, or we could call that sine theta one over sine theta two. By the way, if you test a material, sending light in at different angles, you get a nice straight line. If you plot sine i against sine r, and the gradient gives you the refractive index of that medium. What if we had light going from glass into water, or vice versa, or light traveling between any two media, 
or mediums that aren't air or a vacuum. So we need a more general equation. So what is the refractive index for air? Well, it's going to be one because three times 10 to the eight divided by three times 10 to the eight is gonna be one. So if I was to incorporate this refractive index into this equation and for it to still be true, the only way I could do that is to divide the refractive index of this medium by one. So we've just figured out Snell's law. That is N1 sine theta one, that's the refractive index of the first medium times the sine of the angle of incidence equals N2 refractive index of the second medium times sine of theta two, that's the angle of refraction, that's the angle after it's crossed the boundary. You could get given three of these things and be asked to find out a fourth. If it's to find the refractive index, all you need to do is rearrange to solve for that, to make it the subject. If it's an angle, then you need to rearrange and then do the inverse sign of what you've got to find out the angle. Now, let's say we've got some water here, and we have some air here. Now, if you were a fish down here, and you could spit water up, and you do have these fish, and there's a little bug on there, and you want to spit some water up and take it down, you know that if light comes from this bug, when it hits the water, is it going to bend towards or away from the normal? Well, it's going into a more optically dense medium, so it's gonna to bend towards the normal like this. Now, if this is the light that's reaching the fish here, the fish sees the bug over here because our eyes and fish's eyes think that light travels just in a straight line like that. What's really clever about these things though is that they can actually compensate for it and they know exactly where to shoot in order to compensate for that refraction of light. Now, if you were a shark over here, and there was a scuba diver over here, and there was some coral in between, so they can't see each other directly, could the scuba diver see the shark with the reflection on the surface? Well, let's have a look. Light is coming from the shark up to here. Now, light is going to be refracted, so long as a specific condition is met, and it's going to bend away from the normal, because we know light wants to get away from the normal. But you might not know that we always get a partial reflection as well. We always get a partial reflection. Most of the light is gonna go out here, but some of the light is going to just bounce off. Partial reflection gets clearer, or gets more, at shallower angles. If the light was coming in here instead, then we'd get more of a partial reflection. But we're gonna forget about the partial reflection for now. And we're just gonna be looking at what happens when the angle gets really, really shallow. That's the angle between the boundary. So if light comes in like this from air into water, then that means the light ray bends towards the normal like that. What if we increase the angle of incidence around like that? Well, the angle of refraction would increase but eventually, we're going to reach a limit with our angle of refraction, aren't we? We're gonna hit 90 degrees. And at that point, light can't be refracted anymore. We've reached a maximum angle of refraction. But the point is, whenever light goes from a material with a low refractive index into a high refractive index like air and water, then it's always gonna be refracted. However, what about if we do it the other way around? We have light coming out of the water and going into the air, like so. It's going to be bending away from the normal, what happens if we increase this angle of incidence coming from the bottom more and more and more? Eventually, this angle of refraction is going to reach 90 degrees like that. This angle here is now called the critical angle. Critical angle is the angle of incidence that results in, in light refracted along the boundary. So for glass, that's about 42 degrees. Let's go back to Snell's law real quick. N1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two. But in this case, we know that our angle of refraction is going to be 90 degrees at this point. So we can say N1 sine theta C, that's our critical angle, equals N2 sine 90. Sine of 90 degrees is one, so we can just get rid of that. So we can figure out the critical angle is equals to the refractive index of the second medium divided by the refractive index of the first medium. Now we saw earlier 
that we always have a little bit of a partial reflection, don't we? But what's going to happen above this critical angle? No light is going to be refracted into the other medium. All of the light is going to be contained in the first medium, which means that all of the light is being reflected. Hence the name total internal reflection. When theta one is greater than the critical angle, no light is refracted, all light reflected. And that is T I R, total internal reflection. So you'll notice that we need two things to happen for T I R to occur. Two conditions needed. One, the light must be in the more dense medium. That means the higher refractive index. TIR can't happen if light is going from air into water, it only goes from water into air. And the second condition, like we saw, angle of incidence has to be greater than the critical angle. So those are the two conditions that you need to remember that result in total internal reflection happening. So what is the point of TIR? How can we use it in real life? We can use it with fiber optic cables. We can call that optic fibers. Sometimes you'll see these referred to as step index. We'll talk about why you might call them that in a second. So let's say that this glass core has a refractive index of 1.2. These glass fibers are very, very small. If it was just air outside, which has a refractive index of one, then TIR could happen. When the light comes in at a shallower enough angle, then it's gonna bounce off like that because it's in the medium with the higher refractive index. Problem is it's not a good idea to just have a fiber optic cable, just the optic fiber, the glass bit. Generally, we have protective casings. We might call this the protective sheath. Now this is gonna have a very high refractive index. Let's say it's gonna be N equals 1.8 or something like that. It's gonna just be plastic, isn't it? So the problem is, is if this sheath was touching the glass core, then it would be impossible for TIR to happen. So we need something in between. So what we have is this special cladding around the outside. And this has a lower refractive index than the glass core, which means that TIR can happen. And that's what happens. Light goes along, this fiber optic cable gets sent by a transmitter, received by a receiver, and that's a way that you can send information very quickly. An advantage to fiber optic cables is that you can multiplex. That means sending different frequencies, different wavelengths of light down the same cable. So you could send red light, green light, and blue light, as it were, down this same cable, and they wouldn't interfere with each other, and then they could all be picked up at the other end. Now, when we send light down, we do get a little bit of light disappearing into the cladding as well, but that's not the biggest problem that we face. The problem we face is multipath dispersion. So we have our transmitters at this end, sending out a light ray, and one light ray can take that path there, but another light ray might take this path here. One of these has bounced off very few times. One of these has bounced off quite a few times. This ray here has taken the shortest path from A to B. This one zigzagged across and obviously has taken longer to get to the other side. And that would result in a pulse that looks like that, that's sent, being received, like that. The pulse has been stretched. And that causes a problem when you have a one or a zero in a digital signal interfering with the next one. So what's the solution to this? You make them as thin as possible. By making them as thin as possible, even if a light ray bounces off lots of times, it's not taking that much longer to get to the end than the one that didn't bounce off that many times. It's also true that the longer the cable, the worse the multipath dispersion is. So a way around that is to install relays to take the signal, clean it up, and then reproduce it to go down the next cable. So that's a step index optic fiber. It's called step index because as we go from the core to the outside, we're stepping down refractive index wise to make sure that TIR does happen inside. And that's the end of refraction. If you think I've missed anything, or if you have any questions, please put it in a comment down below and I'll see you next time.